Hi, this is your host, Sapna Bhartiya, and we are here at Open Source Summit in Vancouver. And today we have with us Jordimon, Marketing Director at SPDX. Jordi, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. What, is, what are SBOMPs and why we are talking about them? So, as you point out, there's a lot of concern, I guess initial focus and then eventually concern over software supply chain. I'd like, by the way, to, to make a difference between software supply chain as the, the chain of uh, commercial relationships between clients and vendors, and there's also the uh, software dependency chain, right, which is the relationship between open source project maintainers and releases and the consumers of those. That, those are, at the surface, the same types of relationships, but they, they are not in nature. But in general, if we call both of them software supply chain or elements of the software supply chain, it has been attacked in many ways in the last few years. So since software is just eating the world and it's now everywhere and uh, critical infrastructure is not an exception, then those attacks become really attacks to nation states or, well, attacks to critical infrastructure, which is obviously something that can damage many people and so forth. There are clear examples like uh, a pipeline in the US that kept, uh, you know, uh, that pipeline provided, enabled to provide energy to their clients for affecting millions of people, but there's plenty others that we don't know about. So um, what, what the American government, but also the European government are drafting now, because right now the, at, the, at, at, at the present time, there's nothing yet in terms of like full-fledged acts, and uh, the American ha the Americans have moved a bit faster, and there's certainly a bit of regulation, but it's mostly intentions and signaling that uh, software should have maps or descriptions or least list of ingredients that describe what's in them, and those are S bombs, right? So S bombs stand for S uh, software bill of, of materials, and they basically map what each uh, software package where uh, each software component has and its provenance and a, a few other items. There's a minimum viable number of elements that each SBOM needs to contain, but it can be very, very comprehensive. And the whole goal is what I was saying at the beginning, it's a shining light, uh, providing transparency and security to what has become effectively what's running the world, which is the software supply chain, right? So, so that's the reason, yeah, and you're absolutely right. It's right now under a lot of attack and it's potentially going to get worse, yeah. When we look at S-bombs, you know, uh, can you talk about where, where is the onus, who is responsible? Because when we look at the whole supply chain, you know, there are so many players involved. So talk a bit about, you know, who is responsible, uh, how, which also can mean that it is everybody's responsibility and when some things become everybody's responsibility, nobody does it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, right now, there's no, again, no specific regulation that ties, you know, responsibility or liability of SBOM creation or consumption, by the way, to anyone specifically. It is growing, there's a growing assumption, and I find it very reasonable that, to a certain degree at least, that software creators should be attaching S-bombs, and there's a myriad of type of S-bombs, by the way, not, there's not just one type, um, to every packet and component and piece of software they are creating. But again, that's not mandatory, that's not compulsory. It's a growing pressure that that will happen, right? But that also puts a lot of bur uh, burden on, for example, the individual contributor that keeps a you know, maintains and, and, and keeps adding features and, and, and functionality to a software package, right? And that adds a lot of pressure to that single person or the underfunded project here and there. So on that se in that sense, that is the growing consensus. There's also the other side of things. So who should be consuming and therefore communicating problems with S -bomb, f that have been found in an S-bomb, right? Because you might be generating an S-bomb that describes a packet or a package that has um, a vulnerability, but you might not be aware of it. And it turns out that the consumer of that S-bomb finds out about it and he, he or she should be uh, not forced, but responsible for communicating that vulnerability. So the responsibilities of how the ecosystem of S-bombs needs to flourish 
is is varied and distributed uh, uh, across the across the 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 you know the whole software supply chain and the stakeholders in each one of them. And when we do look at these stakeholders, you know, sometimes there are a lot, lot of vendors, depending on you know what they do, they're more than happy to provide as bonds. But then there are a lot of they're like, hey, this is either extra work, and they feel uncomfortable because sometimes there's a misconception, misconception because you know you need to have the whole inventory, you know, or what is this going. So do you also see that there are certain segments which are like, hey, no, we are not comfortable with releasing as bonds? Yes, of course. I mean, in general, closed source companies are more less inclined to, to create SBOMs, right? Because they are, by definition, companies that are not willing to share that much information about their, their software in general. I'm fairly sure they feel more comfort comfortable sharing that information with their clients, but even at that stage, in general, they, they are not so prone as open source is. Um, so, so in a way, yes, in a way there's that in negative incentive, right, that is, I'm sharing a lot of information about my software and uh, I'm not inclined to do so. But yes, of course, if the tooling, if the automation is not there to make it as seamless as possible to create an S-bomb, for example, during the build process, or even to manually create it and be supported by, I don't know, suggestions and other, other semi-automated semi stuff, it can be a painstaking process, a manual process that requires a lot of um, you know, fetching information from here and there, finding the unique identifiers of certain components and so forth. So it can be a burden. That's why uh, one of the charters of the SPDX uh, um, standard is to foster a community of, of companies, individuals, communities that create that tooling so that databases can consume the spec and all the, so that eventually the end users of of the SPDX uh, format uh, can actually create this in the with the least amount of hassle. Uh, just a minute ago, uh, Gary O'Neill and um, Jeff Shapiro, both Gary, one of the contributors and maintainers of SPDX, but Jeff Shapiro is not involved at all with the project. Just gave a talk about the how to create a minimum viable uh, S bomb, and you can literally create it in five minutes. They did a demo, and it's it's fairly easy. And that was, by the way, a manual process. So uh, when you're talking about meeting the minimum viable requirements for security and transparency, honestly, uh, a JSON file with um, twenty to fifty lines that you can create in five minutes is, I think, achievable to for, uh, to anyone. If you look at Europe, you know, they are talking about SRE or Cyber Resiliency Act, you know, uh, what impact it has on either S-bombs because, you know, a lot of responsibility are going to lie on, you know, yeah. developers or how S-bombs can make it easier. Do you see any relation there? What are the differences between, I, I mentioned a minute ago that the American government is moving a bit faster, not, it's not way ahead, but it's moving faster than the European government and any other governments that have actually done nothing. So these two are the most advanced. The reason why the American government is moving fast is probably because the software industry here is much faster. And also because the representatives of open source um, are bigger here. I mean, there's open source software maintainers, creators, consumers everywhere in the world, but probably the biggest powerhouse is by far the, the US. I'm trying. I'm saying this because in Europe, and especially at the European Parliament, and with the um, main stakeholders at the Commission level and other entities in the European government, they they seem to have a problem defining what a supply chain. What I was mentioning at the beginning, what a supply chain is, and the contracts between a vendor or a source and its consumer. Those are clearly commercial relationships that have their own contracts, agreement, liabilities and so forth, and the um, dependency chain, which is in nature completely different. Uh, open source maintainers, creators, provide, sof provide software as is, and you take the, you as the consumer, um, of the, 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 the person that embeds that software, whatever, you take re full responsibility of what you do with it because uh, no one guarantees you that uh, it's clean, has quality and so forth. And yet the Cyber Resiliency Act makes no difference between those two. So it's demanding from those providing software from a commercial perspective that have funds that make money from it and very legitimately so, uh, the same, they are demanding the same for those that don't make any money from it, right? So so 
right now, as the draft stands, is very it's very unclear. So these people, the 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 stakeholders in the uh, dependency supply uh, dependency supply chain, uh, are, feel very threatened by the Cyber Resiliency Act because it's putting a lot of burden. It might it, it threatens even to not allow them to produce any more software if it doesn't meet the requests uh, the the requirements of creating an S bomb and more, by the way. But it seems like that that's the way. So we are certainly concerned. We the Linux Foundation Europe has voiced uh, concerns. The Eclipse Foundation has voiced concerns against it. And so far, it hasn't been amended. The the draft that is public, there's been improvements, but we are certainly concerned about the lack of this difference between the uh, software supply chain and the um, um, dependency uh, chain. Jordi, thank you so much for taking time out today and of course talk about uh, you, you actually I'm happy that you we touched on some of those aspects of SPOM that we don't talk about. We just, you know, oh yeah, it's good. But so I'm so happy that you talked about uh, it. And also thanks for taking the taking the question about cyber resistance as well. That was important. And as usual, I would love to chat with you again. So thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>